we've got our teams lined up, got our judges ready. Um, you know, they're probably joining in the next minute or two. I'm just going to make quick introductions to the judges. Uh, go ahead, Andres. I was going to say, I think Colin might already be here, but yes, please, let's let's get into it. Yeah, let's just uh, do introductions uh, on uh, on the slides here, and then we can get the show on the road. All right, so. First of all, TKS Focus Hackathon. So we only do so many hackathons. I'd like to just introduce the idea of the hackathon, um, which is in a short amount of time. Please mute if you're not uh, already going. In a short amount of time, TKS students had you know 24, you know 48. They knew about the hackathon before that, so they could have been working on ideas before that. Um, but they had a short amount of time to create a new idea using emerging technologies to solve a big problem. That's it. It's quite broad. There's a lot of different emerging tech categories that could be used here, and our judges reflect that. Uh, Andres, anything you want to say generally about you know the the nature of a focus hackathon and and what happens here? Yeah, totally. You know, I think at the end of the day, what we we're really pushing students to do was take knowledge that they've gained from their focus process, where they're diving deep, becoming technical experts in these different fields of emerging technology, and then really try to leverage that new knowledge into a project that is impactful yeah. and feasible and that's it that's like it was really open-ended and so we got to go. see a lot of interesting creativity right. and uh I'm, I'm really excited for the presentations i'm sure you are too Stu. oh yeah for sure okay these are our judges um and if the judges are here yet we are starting right on time so some of them may be a couple minutes behind uh julie ip um next gen foods julie are you here would you like to say a couple words Yes, hi, I'm Julie Ip. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Looking for, forward to uh, hearing all the students' ideas and I'm really excited. Uh, I come from food tech, um, but you know, love tech and, and always have loved science. Um, and I used to actually, uh, in my church, I used to volunteer for high school students. So I have a big heart for high school students. I'm working with them. So really looking forward to this event. Woo! <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and then we have Kareen. Kareen, are you here? Hi, yes, I am. I'm Kareen. I work at Rise at Schmidt Futures. We review thousands and thousands of projects every year that come from 15 to 17 year olds that are social impact based. Um, so familiar with this kind of work and really excited to see some more presentations today. I also work for selection at the Institute of International Education on their Odyssey Scholarship Program for Refugees. So I'm really looking forward to meeting more of you today. It's amazing. Great. Thanks for the intro. Uh, Colin. Have you made it in? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Colin Cook here. I'm a founder and, and CTO of Extemex Corporation. We work in the cell and gene therapy space to develop production processes for next generation medicine. So think things like uh, AAV, oncolytic medicine, stem cells, uh, and the like. So very much looking forward to, uh, to seeing what you guys have uh, put together. Nice. Yeah, there's definitely a number of projects that are in the uh, biotech, bioengineering space. Uh, and then finally, Vanessa. Vanessa, have you made it in? Yeah, I did. Apologies. I was a bit of a delay. Yes, you're in. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you, you sound great. Awesome. So Vanessa Gassain, based in Amsterdam, working in Shell, the innovation, corporate innovation, uh, very much into decarbonization and new energies. So looking forward to be here. I'm excited to, to hear the pitches and what has been done. Great. That's great. Awesome. Uh, okay. Just very quickly for the judges and for um, everyone else watching and for the students, uh, these are the judging criteria. Uh, actually, Andres, I don't know if you want to you go through this. Andres and I are kind of co-hosting this, so sure. we'll bounce back and forth. Yeah, happy to. And so what we've been telling you, so this isn't news to any of the students, is that the judges uh, have been briefed and what they're looking for is the impact, the execution, the technical details and the clarity of your presentations, right? And so to break that down further, we really wanted to be thinking broad, right? How can you solve a problem that matters, right? And global problems is what we're here to solve at TKS, right? Executable, uh, executable, I should say, uh, we really gave you constraints to say, can you build this within the next three years, right? We didn't want this to be a moonshot project for you to be kind of extrapolating where technology might be way down the line, but rather what can we do now to start having the impact we want? They're going to be looking to understand whether you know your shit, whether you went technically deep on this project and understand how things work, because we don't want to just hear buzzwords. We don't want to hear fluff. Um, we're here to learn. 
And the last thing is clarity, right? At the end of the day, presentations, pitching, it's all about communication, telling stories, and really conveying what we want to convey concisely and clearly. So that's what we're looking for. And we've told these judges not to sugarcoat their feedback, to really you know, give it to you straight and ask really good questions. So they're gonna be pushing you. Um, and I'm not saying that to, to freak you out or scare you, but I just want you to know that, again, we're all here to learn. We're here to get the reps in. If you're not presenting, but you're still joining us here, I want you to be taking notes. I want you to be observing and trying to make sense of what's going well with these teams who are presenting. What are they not doing well? Because we can all stand to learn from this opportunity. Um, last thing I'll say is just like, Big, big thank you. A lot of gratitude for these judges who are taking time out of their busy schedules to be here. Just like, I can't thank you enough. I'm super grateful. Uh, can't wait to hear some of the questions you'll ask these teams. Um, that's all I have to say to you. I'll, I'll pass it back to you and we can, we can get it going. Sounds good. Okay, here we go. Um, these are the awards that will be delivered to teams. Best overall from the judges, the most ambitious award, the TED award for presentation, and finally, the Innovator Award, the People's Choice. So those of you listening in uh, and on the Zoom, when the time comes, we will create a poll and you will have the opportunity to actually vote for who you believe uh, the best is. And so that one may actually end up being, you know, two, uh, one team may end up winning two awards because of the nature of that. Okay, that's what I've got for you. Um, the first team up is HIVAX, all right? HIVAX, so, um, you know, have your presenter ready to share screen. Um, and whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Let's hear it, HIVAX. All right, I'll, I'll keep a timer going to keep us, uh, keep us honest, all right? All right, can you guys hear me? You sound good. Mm -hmm. Awesome, all right. Once, there was a world where a virus ravaged millions of lives, a virus that attacked the very foundation of people's immune system, leaving them 10 years to live. Meet HIV. But as with every story, there were heroes who emerged, determined to find a solution. The most modern medicine designed to fight HIV does not cure it, but only controls HIV with the usage of drugs, leading to various unwanted and painful side effects. At HIVAX, we are dedicated to designing a solution preemptively in order to stop the HIV virus from spreading if it ever enters the body. But before I begin explaining our solution, I think it is important to get the rudimentary concept of what a virus is and how a virus spreads. A virus is an infectious microbe that contains genetic information and is coated with protein. Now, what a virus does is it actually hijacks a cell and uses its internal machinery to create more copies of the virus. And this is known as the lictic cycle. However, the less talked about cycle, known as the lysogenic cycle, is when the virus is dormant at homostasis, simply creating the virus passively. Now, the driving force to our solution is the spacer DNA. Now, I would like to bring up an analogy to really understand what's the point of this viral spacer DNA. And I want to think of it as a sleeper agent. And a sleeper agent is a spy that remains dormant in a foreign country until it is further activated. And in our case, this activation is when HIV becomes present in the cell. Now, the spacer DNA contains multiple components. A lambda uh, repressor is an on and off switch, which can take a cell from the lictic cycle to the lysogenic cycle and vice versa. We will also have an HIV-1 RT detection site, which will be able to inform the viral spacer DNA if there are any traces of HIV found in the cell. The CRISPR will also allow the viral spacer DNA to penetrate inside chromosome 12, specifically the CLRT gene, which we opted to using since it's always passively on. There will also be multiple promoter sites as well as a self-cloning CRISPR, but I want to touch upon those components in our later slides. Now that we understand the role of our viral spacer DNA, let's dive into the three functions that it will be completing. There will be a delivery stage, which is when the viral spacer DNA will be transported into the cell with the help of CRISPR. The elimination stage is when the viral DNA will be using the necessary components to help the cell go through apoptosis once HIV has been detected. And for our propagation stage, we will be propagating the artificially synthesized virus in order to maximize its effectiveness. Now on the delivery stage, HIV actually targets helper T cells. 
So we want to insert our viral spacer DNA into the blood stem cell, ensuring that every leukocyte created from it will have a copy of our sleeper agent. And we will be inserting it by coating the viral spacer DNA and the CRISPR with lipid nanoparticles that once it has permeated through the cell membrane will dissolve in the cytosol. In our elimination, we will be using a lock and key method. Our, our viral spacer DNA will be creating a complementary HIV RT RNA. And once there's an HIV DNA present, the HIV DNA will be creating its own HIV RNA. Now with our complementary RNA, it will be having a protein BACS. And this BACS is so important as BACS actually initiates the apoptosis process. Now, once the HIV RNA and the complementary HIV RNA that comes from the viral spacer DNA connect, the protein backs will be eliminated from the two and it will go to the mitochondrial membrane, beginning the apoptosis process. Now, before apoptosis begins, our viral spacer DNA is now tasked to do the following two things. It wants to tell the Cas9 in order to cut the HIV DNA from the cell. And it also wants to make more duplications of itself. So once the cell does go through apoptosis, it will vomit all of its DNA, meaning that all of the duplicated viral spacer DNAs will be going to the other healthy blood stem cells. In the future, we wish to create an intravenous vaccine, which will be injected into all children or anyone who has not yet contacted HIV. This way, if HIV is ever developed in the future, there will be a built-in mechanism already there helping to repress the HIV before it even perfilerates and spreads. If they never develop HIV, then our dormant viral spacer DNA will never activate and thus will have no side effects unlike our current solutions. At HIVAX, we are empowering the future one HIVAX at a time. Thank you. Amazing. Good job. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Let's, uh, oh, Andres. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Alana, could you put your slides back up just in case the judges have any specific slides they want to yeah, ask sorry questions about? about? That. No, that's sure. all right. Um, but yeah, let, let's take some, uh, some judges questions. Oh, it's the wrong thing. One second. There you go. Okay, judges, um, whoever wants to go first, whoever has a burning question, just feel free to unmute and let, let's hear it. Ilana, hey, Colin here. Um, I'll go first, I guess. Um, you were proposing to hit all of the um, stem cells with these lipid-based nanoparticles. What percentage of them do you think you would need to hit in order to provide this level of immunity? Because it would seem to me that if there are remaining stem cells that have not been hit, um, they're going to be susceptible to, to viral infection. Yes. So what we want to begin, of course, is only using one. But of course, cells, um, once apoptosis happens, they will actually be traveling to the other stem cells. And let's say if HIV actually never contacts these cells, these cells will still be going through meiosis and splitting. And also the other cells that might have not even gotten the sleeper agent will also be dying or splitting. So um, we're still not quite sure, but uh, because cells move and also reproduce at such a fast rate, I don't think it will take a long time in order for these cells to reach this level of immunity. And also if anyone in my group would like to add on, um, they are welcome to. Yeah, I just wanna add on right here. Um, so I definitely think that we would have to um, insert our sleeper agent into nearly all the bone marrow inside the body, so all the blood stem cells. Um, the additional apoptosis, apoptosis stage, um, that just maximizes the effectiveness of the cell. So I guess if the T cell that contains the sleeper agent were to uh, under, like have HIV, then it would spread to other surrounding T cells, um, ensuring if, uh, immunity there. But to answer your question, Colin, I definitely think the percentage would be high as we would definitely have to target a lot of the stem cells before we could um, ensure max, like max, uh, my, maximize immunity. Well, thank you. Thanks for your question, Colin. Any of the other judges want to chime in? We could do probably like one more question before we move on. 
Um, hi, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about your implementation plan. So you spoke about vaccines um, and vaccines for children in particular, which obviously we know comes with a lot of testing and trial periods and ethical considerations. I was wondering if your group had thought much about timeline there or what the realistic um, barriers might be to achieving that. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have actually come up with a three year timeline. And if anyone in my group would like to talk about it, um, but what we want to do is we want to, um, in the end, we want to have it as a vaccine where um, it will be mandatory for children to have. I know that in certain grades, when um, it becomes where the STI vaccines are needed, such as, for example, hepatitis, that is our end goal that we want to have this vaccine there. But if anyone else in my group would like to um, expand on this idea. Yeah, um, I can chime in here. Um, Ilana, you want to just switch the slide? We actually yeah. have the implementation plan made. Yes. Yeah. So we decided to split up our implementation plan into a couple of different steps. So starting with the actual characterization of the virus. So there has been a lot of research about that specific virus. So HIV has been a problem for many years. And so the genetic code was actually available to many people in the 1980s. And it has been further publicized in like recent years, which is really interesting because now science scientists can actually take that information and they can translate it into proper scientific research and actually create the virus or create the vaccine. So in 2023, which is this year, because we have so much information readily available, we could definitely begin preclinical trials. So the trials on animals will definitely depend on the availability of funding and the resources, as well as the progress of the research. So because, like I mentioned, the research is so readily available, it will be very easy to actually begin this um, preclinical trials and it can begin right away. And because HIV is such a large problem, it impacts over 40 million people. It can definitely be easy to obtain the actual funding needed to tr translate this research into a vaccine. And then for clinical development, there are normally three phases for clinical trials. Sean, Sean, and so, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off here um, just for the sake of equity. Um, Karine, thank you for the, the awesome question. Um, but we wanna keep moving here. Uh, We'll, we'll have more chances here from other, other folks as well in these judges. So thank you so much to the HIVAX team and for that presentation. Thank you so much for the questions, judges. Yeah, and maybe in general, we'll keep it to uh, two questions after each presentation, just so we can finish on time. Uh, thanks for that, Andres. Yeah. Um, okay, next up we have Cropsia. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead and screen share and present. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes, you sound great. All right, uh, hello judges. First off, I'd like to thank you for your time. And um, my name is Idhan and my team and I for the past 48 hours have worked hard and fast to bring to you Cropsia, a solution that will revolutionize the world of agriculture. So each year over $220 billion, which is about 40% of global crop production is lost. And to what? Plant disease, according to the government of the UK. We want you to meet Antoine Durand. Antoine is 87, he's retired, he's an apple farmer and lives in the north of France. Because of his old age, he's incapable of always walking around and checking on the health of his crops. For vulnerable farmers like Antoine and others, we have created a three-pronged solution. First, we use drones to collect aerial images such as NDVI to using sensors on the camera. Next, we use computer vision aided with the help of a neural network to perform image classification and identify crop diseases. And finally, we provide spot on accurate and scalable recommendations to prevent the spread of crop diseases. Our drones work on two main principles, precision plus cameras. So as you can see, the, the camera is mounted on a swivel, so it can rotate almost 270 degrees, and it uses a technology called NDVI. So NDVI is normalized differential um, vegetation index. So that monitors how green the pixels on a plant is. So the greener the plant is, um, the higher the NDVI index is, which means the healthier the plant is. So a lot of people say that a neural network is only as good as its data set is, and they're right. So our data set already contains over 87,000 images. About half of these are images of healthy plants, and the other half are images of diseased plants. So the end goal is to train our algorithm to be able to identify about 38 different diseases. So the basic architecture of our neural network is modeled, is modeled after the MNIST data set. 
So the in the MNIST data set, we assign each output a numerical value from zero to nine, so one of 10 classes, and we calculate the probability of each of these 10 classes occurring. Again, this is the MNIST data set. So in our situation, because there's 38 different diseases, we have 38 different classes. So an example of our neural network in play is on the left, we have a leaf infected with apple cedar rust. So the algorithm doesn't know that yet. So using its image processing techniques, it would be able to calculate with over 90% certainty that the disease is in fact apple cedar rust. So you may be wondering why choose us? Well, our unique advantage is that we draw the best from over three worlds, AI, drones, and scalable recommendations. So thanks to Vivek, we were also able to finalize a mock-up. So in the mock-up, farmers can see drone surveillance like real time. They can monitor disease progression. They can see recommendations for how the disease is progressing and how to treat it. And finally, community outreach. Community outreach is important because for farmers that are in a money crunch, they can share their drone surveillance with another farmer for both of their farmland. So Abilash was able to finalize a cost analysis for us. So the cost of applying our technology per acre is almost $1.30. In high contrast, the increase in profit per acre due to the application of our technology is 20%. For reference, the profit per acre of an apple orchard per annum is almost $2,300. And the increase in profit for the farmer per acre per year is $464. So in total, the farmer is making almost $2,800 in profit, thanks to us. Thank you. We hope your interest in crops that can help fuel tomorrow's agriculture and help assist farmers like Antoine. And now it's open for questions. All right. Thank you for that presentation. Judges, do uh, you have any questions? We can take two. I'm happy to take one. Well, thank you for the presentation. Very, very interesting, actually, to me. I work in natural-based solutions, so in a way, it's, a, it's an interface. So my question to you is, how do you expect this to be scaled up? And did you consult with your customers how that will work? I think I, I stopped there. Thank you. Oh, uh, for sure. First, I'd like to open this because our team actually divided up the questions. Is there anyone who'd like to answer this question? I mean, I can start. Well, we actually haven't got customer feedback due to time. Uh, I'll admit that. But uh, scalability, we'd assume that we'd add more features based on our camera and it can uh, classify more um, diseases and uh, depending on the technology and everything, it'll, it'll scale up a bit more. Yeah, Abilash. Yeah, and our, our plan is also to make this whole operation automated. So to have uh, the flight paths for any given drone uh, com completely automated. So the, the farmer has almost nothing to do. Uh, the drone would leave in the morning, for example, and go to a certain farm, and then it would be able to come back and give us the data of that farm. So that, that way we can scale it to uh, any, uh, any place essentially, as long as they can afford the drone. And since we've impl implemented cost of uh, things to make the cost uh, as less of a burden as we can, we think they can be very scalable around the world. And I also just want to add that as technology becomes better, so as these cameras become better, we will also be able to include more high resolution images. And as even AI becomes better, we would even have better time image for image classification. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, we got time for one more question. Anybody else? I can go for a second then. Eh? It's sure. even more interesting, Thank I you. hope. I'm looking to, to see about data and sustainability. So basically energy usage and as well any material for circularity. Any thoughts about that? Um, I can start us off here, but um... So the drone model we chose in specific was a DJI drone model. And um, DJI is actually working to make most of their drones uh, powered on electric batteries. So I guess the only sustainability component in that was to make the drones completely green. And if DJI is already transitioning to green drones, then it would be 
all the more helpful to our sustainability goal. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions, Vanessa, um, and, and for that presentation, Cropsia and team. Um, let's go and keep moving on. Let's keep moving on to the next presentation. Who's on the agenda, Stephen? Uh, we got PYE. So if you guys could make sure you get your presentation ready and start whenever you're good. Okay. Hi, judges. I am Drishti, and we are going to be talking about autism. 75 million individuals are diagnosed with autism annually. To make matters worse, one in four of these individuals lacks diagnosis. The simple problem that we are present today is that autism within our society is becoming a more and more evident issue, and we simply do not have enough treatment issues right now. And that is the exact problem that we here at PI want to solve. The problem starts with late diagnosis. The simple problem is often too late, we know that somebody has autism. And we, when we know too late, it's almost impossible to treat then. The second problem is that there is no objective form of communication that doctors can actually get from the day-to-day -day lives of autistic patients. And third, there is little to no traceability, making it hard for just a patient to know if their autism is getting worse or if their autism is staying relevant. And that is the exact problem that we here want to solve by using eye reactivity as a biomarker. What we aim to do is we used, want to use pupil dilation. When light is reflected into your eye, your pupil eventually dilates. The amount of time it takes for your pupil to actually go back to its regular position has a big indicator for how autistic the patient is likely. 95% of autistic patients have a delayed pupillary reflex. Autistic patients suffer a 12 millisecond delay in eye constriction. By utilizing these features, we can provide an effective biomarker that is going to be easy to scale and one that is going to tell us more about autistic patients and how severe their disorder is. And this is exactly what we want to do here at Pi. Here we have a mock-up that demonstrates how our app is going to work. Eventually, you're going to start off with a login page, and then we're going to scan your eye. A quick second is going to be flashed into your eye, and from then, we're going to eventually take around one minute to get a report. This report will tell you more about your pupil size and the rate of pupil re-increase and finally make a diagnosis for how severe the autism is. From that, you can easily contact experts, whether it be from our community of experts or just send these reports to any of your personal doctors. By doing that, your doctors now have a better assessment for how autism is occurring within your brain. Moving further on, the specific plan that we want to do this through is first by eye identification, which we will implement through a genetic algorithm. We will detect the pupil after we detect the eye region through a canny classifier. After that, we will measure the diameter through the Huff transform. And finally, we will calculate the rate that it actually takes for your pupil to dilate and go back to normal by just taking in the time to return to the normal undilated pupil. Specifically, first, we will look at eye identification through a genetic algorithm. A genetic algorithm models on random selection where the fittest survives. The way that we want to create this is by randomly having random variables for the rotation, scaling, and rotation angle of the pupil. From then, we will eventually input them into a fitness factor, which will figure out how closely associated they are with the other factors that exist. From then, we will eventually quote unquote reproduce these layers that are most likely to be fit and using mutations and crossing overs by specifically converting the parameters to binary values and then swapping the zeros and ones, we'll be able to get more variety amongst these factors and just in general, get more accuracy as the algorithm proceeds. Currently, this algorithm can be implemented with a 97.9% accuracy and can occur in 28 milliseconds per image frame, meaning that it's easily likely that we will get this entire thing done within the one minute time set that we have. The second part of our algorithm is going to work to specifically detect the pupil. The way that we want to do that is by eventually having the color difference between the sclera and the darker region, the iris. By having both of these components, we're easily able to detect where the pupil is going to be. From doing so, we can then move on to the next step, which is going to be specifically about finding the diameter and where it's going to be measured as. The diameter will be measured by finding the center. However, the problem that we right now have is that when we actually measure the pupil, it's not usually always just one circle. It's usually blotches of space. And eventually we need to employ a voting system where each of the border points vote for what they believe is the center. From then we find which one is the most likely component to be the center. And from then we're easily able to find the distance between that center and all of the border components. The largest of these distances is going to be the radius, which times two would be the diameter. From finding the diameter, we can then easily calculate how long it takes to get back to that regular value. We will have a period of dilation followed by a period of recovery. Our solution, solves the three primary problems that we have today. It solves the problem of late diagnosis by having simple and convenient diagnosis at home. 
It solves the problem of little traceability by providing daily progression reports, and it solves the problem of communication by having objective measures that can easily be communicated to medical experts. The simple idea is our solution is of a future, a future that we need today. The impact is simple. 6.8 billion people have access to a smartphone. However, despite that, we do not use the smartphone enough, specifically to diagnose the diseases that primarily exist. We need to change this impact now. I want 40 years of my life back. This is a statement that we cannot allow to be said by the millions of autistic patients that lack treatment today. This is a statement that we need to reverse now. Make detecting autism a piece of pie. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Let's open it up to uh, some questions from our wonderful judges. Anybody wanna jump in here with a question? I'll just ask a, a simple question and thanks for the presentation. Um, so you indicated that there's a 95% correlation between a, a delayed pupillary reflex and autism. My concern would come down to the false positives that you would get because autism has a fairly low prevalence rate in society. And so if you're test, you have all these parents who are so concerned about their kids, they're all out testing. Is there a risk of over-diagnosing autism? There is a risk of overdiagnosis, but the primary function for our project is to assess the severity of autism for patients that usually already have autism. So from then, they can easily track their progression as it's occurring. As for the case of false diagnosis, because a lot of this eventually develops later on, it won't necessarily be applied only to children. And if it is fake diagnosis, simply having a delayed pupillary reflex is still a concerning factor. So that like parents can actually go to the doctor and just further get more information on this. So it's like, yes, there is a risk of over positive and like just getting more and more risks, but because we can eventually use this for other applications and because it allows them to actually know more about the risk in general, they can use other forms of diagnosis after that. And did you show data or is there data that correlates the progression of the disease with the length of the delay? Yes. Uh, this is specifically seen, um, I think, from the biomarker slide that we talk about here. What we see here is that the longer the time it takes to actually get your pupil to undilate, it, the longer and like like the worse the nerve health is for the brainstem. So that just easily helps correlate it because the entire reason that we're able to use this pupil reflex is because the longer the pupil reflex is, the longer it takes for your brain to actually react to that and the worse the brain stems health is. So yes, we're able to correlate the two. Okay, um, maybe time for one more quick question. Any other judges wanna jump in and ask a question? All right, if not, we can certainly keep moving forward. Nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, thank you so much team for your presentation. Let's keep moving. Up next, we have Pitch. So the Pitch team, please jump in and we'll get going. All right, ready when you are. Uh, hey judges, I'm Rana and I'll be presenting on behalf of my team. We're all very grateful for the time you're taking to be here with us today. So what you're seeing here is the process we've come to expect and hope for when it comes to a disease. You're screened, you're diagnosed, and hopefully cured. But the question is, do all diseases have a cure? The answer is no, they don't. And this is where we need an effective plan B. Enter early detection. The reason why this is so important is because it offers an alternative pause. Through early detection, we can ensure that the given drugs to patients are more effective so that they can better manage their symptoms. We're increasing what matters most, the health span, the number of years we spend healthy and truly alive. An example of a disease with a cure is Parkinson's disease, the second most common neurodegenerative disease. What happens is nerve cells in the substantia nigra begin to break down, producing less dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical responsible for many functions in your body, one of them being motor control. With a lack of dopamine, patients experience symptoms like tremors, slowed movement, muscle stiffness, stiffness and impaired balance, which significantly impacts their life quality. So the impact of PD has been devastating. Since the year 2000, it has caused 3.2 million more disability adjusted life years and 100% more deaths caused by it. 
This is because unlike many diseases, it's not declining, but steadily increasing. The economic burden in the US alone is almost at $52 billion. So because it doesn't have a cure, a medication called levodopa is given to patients. And what it does is that it replaces the missing dopamine so that symptoms can become more manageable. So we don't see a problem here. Why can't patients just continue taking levodopa? Well, the problem is that Parkinson's is often detected at later stages. By then, 80% of dopamine neurons would have already died. So in this case, levodopa, the medication, becomes simply ineffective. And to prevent this from happening, it is vital that we detect Parkinson's early. This is where our solution, the application pitch, comes into play. We are targeting high-risk patients, mainly older people or ones with a family history of PD. Our user interface has bigger buttons and a simple layout in order to cater to this audience. Now, various studies have shown that our own voices can be suitable biomarkers to indicate the onset of Parkinson's disease at an early stage. Through the app, users can take a voice test at every set time period. This time period is set by their neuro neurologist. For the test, what users are required to do is read a 500 word article displayed on their screen. And this would take them an average of 1.7 minutes. After the user has finished recording, the audio is processed. And this is to ensure the noise around them is reduced and the audio quality is high. Then we've selected five features because studies have shown that these five features change when a person is developing Parkinson's disease. We're measuring the time taken by them to read, the fraction of correctly pronounced words, the pause percentage, the, vo the volume variance, which is the average volume of the first half of the recording minus the second half, and lastly, the pitch variance. All these five features are inputted into an artificial neural network. On the ANN, here's the ANN. On the left, you see the input layer. This is where we enter our five features. Two hidden layers are optimal to detect Parkinson's. So we have A1 and A2. Each line represents the data going from the node to the left to the one on the right, and there's a bias and a weight being applied to it. So you can think of the data as getting transformed. Then when it goes from A2 to the output, a softmax function is being applied, forcing the yes and no nodes to be either zero or one. One being yes, there are signs of the disease, and zero being no, there aren't signs of the disease. This is the sample output screen. So on your right, you see a negative result where all the patient's voice features are normal. And on, and on the left, you see a positive result, where abnormalities in these five features indicate that there are signs of Parkinson's disease. If there are signs, the user is prompted to contact their neurologist. The reason we've chosen to use an app is for one sole reason, accessibility, because everyone deserves a quick, accurate, and personalized way to potentially avoid the effects of this disease. Because when we detect Parkinson's disease early, treatments like levodopa are substantially more effective, so patients can better cope with their symptoms and even experience fewer and less severe ones. Not having a cure should not be the end, because we are increasing what matters most, the health span. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, judges, do we have questions? I'll ask a, a quick question about um, how this app actually gets delivered to these patients. So you indicated that early detection is, is very important, but what would prompt an individual to go and download your app unless they already had a suspicion of Parkinson's? And if they already had a suspicion of Parkinson's, why wouldn't they go in for a, a proper diagnosis with their physician? So I guess the question okay. is really, how do you get this app to be used by the people who will, it will benefit the most? Okay, one way we can promote this app to people who will benefit most from it is that symptoms of Parkinson's can appear way after the disease starts. So because of this like large number of years, patients like would be, would be prompted to like download the app especially if they're high risk, because if they have like a close relative with Parkinson's disease, or if they're like advancing into old age, it would be beneficial for them to download the app, especially since it's more accessible for them to just have it at home and not go when like symptoms are detected. Because even if they do go, like the diagnosis would be like much later than it would be if they use the app. Yeah. Can I follow up with a question? Sure, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Go for it. Sure. I, I really like the question of Colin. So just, just a bit uh, using, using that platform 
about data privacy. So I'm thinking if, if you would do democratized tool which people could check safely with private entries, probably you can actually prompt people to worry about things more proactively or to, to prevent them. So my question is, ha, have you thought about how this could work? And actually, by the way, that's the question I perhaps should have posted from the previous as well about this, this aspect. How do you see this uh, working? Uh, I'm going to redirect this question to Lars and Shrew. Uh, yeah. Hey, so I'm Lars. Uh, we actually talked about this um, when we made the project. So our our thoughts was that um, no data will like be sent anywhere else than your phone. So the neural network is performs on your phone. We don't know exactly how much processing power it's going to take, but in the case that it's um, uh, not, not so much that it has to be on the cloud, they can perform on your phone. And then you get the results yourself. No one else gets the results of whether you have signs of Parkinson's or not. Uh, so then you can uh, contact a neurologist afterwards. No one else has to get the information. Yep. All right, great questions. Thanks for that, judges and team. Um, I love, I don't know, the innovation of a lot of these ideas, thinking about combining technology that exists pretty readily with uh, diseases that you know, need a better uh, diagnosis. That's great. Okay, next up, MediChat. MediChat, whenever you're ready, go ahead and screen share and start presenting. Um, so I'd first like to just thank you uh, to all the judges and the directors for this amazing opportunity. Um, my team and I are just very grateful for it. Uh, so yeah, other, other than that, I'm ready to go. So imagine this, you are given a puzzle with a bunch of missing pieces. You can put those pieces together, but without the missing pieces, you're never really going to get the full picture. This is the reality for 12 million Americans annually who are missing their puzzle pieces. They are being misdiagnosed and led in the wrong direction for a treatment. And out of those 12 million people, 100,000 people go on to die because of the misdiagnosis. And a large portion of those people will actually get more sick because they are not having the proper treatment. This is a very prevalent issue. A 60% of people are misdiagnosed for Lyme disease. 50% are misdiagnosed for Stills disease and 40 are misdiagnosed for multiple sclerosis. So it's pretty evident that misdiagnosis hurts everyone from patients to family to doctors and everyone in between. So what's the core problem here? The core issue is that general practitioners don't have enough exposure to rare diseases and uh, illnesses to really cover all their areas and be super confident before diagnosing a person with a specific illness or disease. So what if we had some sort of chat bot like ChatGPT that was able to sort of an, uh, analyze all of the patient's information, um, all of their medical history, and all of their symptoms and sort of assess and come up with all the possible illnesses that they might have. Introducing MediChat. MediChat would be an online resource for doctors to simply put in the patient's past information, their medical history, and all of their symptoms. And then from there, MediChat would be able to make a prediction of all the potential illnesses that the person might have. Okay, so let's break this down so it kind of makes a little bit more sense. So first off, we would have an input, which would be the doctor putting in like the potential illness or the symptoms that the patient has and their past um, medical history. And then from there, the model will go through a pre-processing uh, step. And this step, what it, it essentially does is it assigns weights and uh, so assigns weights on specific words by looking at the other words in the sentences. So this is kind of be visualized by looking at things like adjectives, nouns, and verbs. And then from there, what happens is, in considering these emphasis, it starts to break apart the sentences and it only focuses on these words. Then what happens is it goes through an encoder process where we simply have to convert from the human English language to a mathematical language so that it's more uh, easy for the computer to understand because the computer can't understand English, of course. So then what happens is we assign all of these all this information into something called a matrix. The matrix is then sent through a neural network and then the network kind of makes a prediction and that information is still relayed in a matrix. 
The matrix then goes through a decoder, which takes the matrix, the mathematical language, and converts it into the English language. And then finally, we have the output, where which has appeared on the screen so that the doctor can sort of have a comprehensive list of all the potential issues and illnesses that a patient might have. Okay, so sometimes when I talk about networks, I like to kind of break it down like they're little kids. So when we were little, our parents kind of told us like when we were doing something bad or when we were doing something good, and they kind of told, uh, were trying to teach us like how to be better. So they would give us feedback. This is exactly what we need to do with models as well. They're like little kids. We have to train them. Uh, so we can do this through something called reinforcement learning through human feedback. Essentially, what will be done is the doctor will arrange all of the, the, the information that the model relayed in a way that it will have usefulness and the truthfulness of all the information. And then what we can do is we can feed that information through something called a reward model, which essentially assigns a value to how well the previous network performed. And that can sort of tell it, okay, I did really good, I am doing good, or I did really bad and I need to reanalyze. Uh, re so the issue with chatbots is that sometimes they're a little sneaky in the sense that they can give us information and it sounds like they're being really confident, but it's actually not truthful. So in order to sort of circumvent that and go around that, we kind of came up with this idea of like having the model, uh, the doctor really communicate with the model and sort of separate the wrong information and the right information. And then it's going to be trained using that feedback that the, the doctor um, gave to the model, and it's going to sort of go back and fix any errors that it may have had. Okay, so with all of that said, I would like to bring you back to building this puzzle. With MetaChat, we will fill in the missing pieces and slowly bring that 12 million to zero. Join us to redesign medicine as we know it, one step at a time. Thank you. Nice. I love the puzzle analogy. That's, that's great. Uh, all right. Judges, what do you think about MediChat using AI to organize medical information here? Um, I, I guess I can ask a question. Um, I've got five physicians here with me uh, this weekend, and I'm always telling them that AI is, is coming for their job. <laughs> um, but my, you know, part of that, though, is, is can this be done with, within three years? And so my question for you is, have you thought about a beachhead disease that's very poorly diagnosed today that you could build this network around to increase the diagnostic, you know, power that you have for that one disease? Because right now, you're talking about you know all of these diseases and so is there one that you would target initially to get it done within three years yeah for sure so we haven't really investigated a specific disease however our idea was that the model itself could be trained on um various medical case studies and medical um, like textbooks, sort of like training a doctor. And so we figured that we could do something similar like that. So that way it has information about a lot of diseases all at once. So I feel we felt that we felt as though it would help bring to light some potential rare diseases or diseases in general or illnesses that a doctor may otherwise not have thought of when diagnosing a patient. So we didn't really narrow in on one specific uh, illness, but we kind of wanted to generalize it to make it sort of more impactful in our opinions. I can also Thank add on this. Um, so the way, the reason actually we like target general practitioners is because the current like the state of the um, AI models, especially like generative models like this, are not yet at their fullest capability to, you know, gather a lot of information about those like specialized disciplines or like specialized illnesses. Because a lot of the time, the doctors that are like specialized in certain disciplines actually have like a much more in-depth knowledge about diseases. And like the, with the current technology, it's hard to actually get that the same level of knowledge, uh, accumulate that same level of knowledge to like neural networks. So, um, so based on that, we just like decided to do, so since AI is able to like, um, get knowledge on many different disciplines and have that breadth of knowledge, general practitioners will be able to inquire the conversational bot to get like more information and go deeper in certain diseases they don't really know about. Yes, I have a question just to, as a test. Is, is this gonna be more towards educational tool for the self users 
or is this is how 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 do you envision the, the funding and the monetization of this? For sure. So uh, thank you for your question, first of all. Uh, second of all, we did some research into this and there are like sort of similar technologies being done already, but it's like a little different. It's more for the use of the patient. And a lot of doctors, sorry, not doctors, insurance companies have actually mentioned that they would be willing to like fund this because it almost helps to prevent malpractice. So that would definitely be um, a, like one source of funding as, uh, uh, as, as, this, as this idea moves forward. Um, in terms of like what its main use is for, like as we mentioned, we were sort of targeting general practitioners just because they see so many patients, they see so many things, and they, it's like sort of impossible for them to like memorize everything that they did in medical school like years ago. So our idea was to sort of help um, aid them in that process and sort of kind of remind them of like uh, specific things that they may have forgotten in, in order to like properly diagnose and go through the whole process to make sure that they're covering Every everything before they can like confidently say this is what you have. Uh, Michael also has something more here. So I uh, actually we're, we're like planning to uh, put this conversational bot to the market. So like since these general practitioners can like use this bot to like arrive at certain diagnosis diagnosis is faster because they can consider and like eliminate um, different diseases faster through like the, the knowledge they like gain through this conversational bot. We're thinking of um, offering a value value to hospitals in terms of reduced time spent per patient, and that that equals um, like um, increased profits. Great answers, guys. Okay, thanks for that question and answer session. Let's move on to our final presentation, uh, which is or pitch, I should say, which is regeneration. Let's see it, guys. Whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. My name is Divya. I'm 15 years old, and I live in Ontario, Canada. I'm so grateful and excited to have this opportunity to present my group's pitch to everyone here. So as a kid, I was a very talkative kid, and playing the silent game was absolute terror. I would only be able to stay quiet for a few minutes at most. But this is the living reality of many individuals. One infection is all it takes to get vocal cord paralysis, or VCP. There's been a certain number of cases in the recent years which paralysis has been missed, even though the symptoms are present. This is probably due to VCP not being as well known. VCP is a condition where you do not have control over the movements of your muscles that control your voice. It happens when the nerve impulses of your voice box are completely disrupted, leading to the paralysis of vocal cord muscles. VCP can stem from vocal cord injuries from surgeries, tumors, infections, and even neurological conditions. Infections and viruses are a very big thing now because a new virus that VCP can stem from is COVID-19. There are many existing solutions such as voice therapy, bulk injections, surgery, or even a combination of many treatments, but the current treatments are not entirely effective. I'll give an example. Renovation, a current best solution out there is a method where you put part of the nerve that is transplanted from somewhere else, but it takes away the sensation from the doning area completely and also takes six to nine months to heal. VCP is the second most common lanyard anatomy from birth in children. This type of process can lead to voice of, loss of voice, as well as difficulty speaking, breathing, and even swallowing. Additionally, VCP can indicate a larger underlying health issue that needs to be addressed. The market for VCP right now can reach a value of $3.2 billion by the end of 2028 based on increasing numbers of paralysis and voice disorder in patients and investment into better solutions and increasing healthcare costs. So welcome to regeneration, where we go directly to the root of the problem in VCP, which is the nerve that is damaged or degenerating. Our solution is to protect, and you could say support the nerve using bionics with a method called bionic conductive nerve scaffolding and stimulating the nerve using optogenetics to repair those peripheral, which is non-brain or spine related nerves. 
the bionic scaffold would be inserted through surgery that supports the damaged nerve and guides its growth by either connecting it to ex sorry by either connecting it to existing nerves in the vicinity or by connecting it to the another end of the same damaged nerve this would be made out of biocompatible materials such as PLLA fiber mats. And here is where we differ from existing solutions. In our solution, we use optogenetics to stimulate nerves using light. This is done by genetically modifying nerve cells to contain proteins that respond to light. This causes the neuron to fire whenever the light is present. We introduce anno-associated virus carrying a plasmid containing genetic code for the production of these light-sensitive proteins. When these cells fire, it will cause a nerve cell's axons and encourage the formation of Schwann cells. They do this by surrounding the cell and forming a protective myelin sheath. Regrowing the axon is extremely important as it ensures the larynx muscles and brain are connected. To combat vocal paralysis, we would specifically target the two recurrent larynx nerves using optogenetics. This will allow the patient to regain control of their larynx and thus their voice and ability to keep food from going down the windpipe. We have a 3D model of our prototype. So this is a light that is reflected using a mirror on this side and the optogenics. And as we zoom in, we can see the scaffold, which is encompassing the nerve and helping it soon regrow over time. Using a similar process, our solution can also be applied to paralysis in most areas of the body. Our solution can help millions of people lead better lives. Worldwide, peripheral nerve injuries affect 1 million people a year, and we have the power to completely decrease this number. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, last but not least, let's do another round of questions from our wonderful judges. Any thoughts, questions you want to share? Feel free to unmute. Okay, I suppose it was it was so thorough. Um, we we're left without any questions, um, which is fine. Uh, uh, last call. I, I, I'll ask one. I'll ask one. <laughs> All right, Tom. Yeah. I love it. So, Thank you. One of the challenges when you, you go and put an implant in the body is you get a lot of inflammation and scar tissue formation around, you know, the electrode in your case, mm -hmm. around the, the fiber optics. Um, it, have you thought about how putting this implant in close proximity to a place where you actually want healing to take place is actually going to compromise the healing? Do you have any thoughts on whether it's going to be a net benefit or it's actually going to detract from, from the healing of the nerve? I definitely think it might, maybe in the beginning stages of this prototype, it might um, refrain from the healing of the nerve. But I think in future, when this technology advances a little bit more as optogenetics is still a little bit new in today's society, there will be better improvements. I'd like to pass this question on to my group members if they have Anything to add on to this? Uh, yeah, so some uh, some of the um, more like typically like used now treatments for nerve paralysis, like uh, in the throat and stuff, they actually already cause a lot of scarring and stuff. So I believe that um, with our treatment, it would be uh, about the same level. It's yeah, because and the we the the they wouldn't have to be on a yeah, uh, and since our treatment is faster than, uh, like, has a faster healing time than some of the treatments that are used now, it would also be, I think, a net benefit, but it would also have to depend on the patient and, like, what their individual reaction is to it. Um, Do you I see this implant staying in, or is this being removed after the healing has, has finished? Um, so for the scaffold, um, our plan was to make it uh, dissolve, um, absorb sort of over time because there are bionic scaffolds that are able to sort of, the body is able to absorb. And that that was our, our plan for the scaffold. So it wouldn't have to be surgically removed.
Good answers. Okay. This is an example of one of those um, conditions that you wouldn't have thought was a condition. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes part of the challenge here is just finding a good problem. And I think this is one that I'd never heard of that uh, is interesting to try to tackle. Cool. Okay, I'm going to try to get the judges to make decisions quickly here. We're going to go into a breakout room, uh, have a conversation about what we think the best groups are. We'll come back within, it could be five, ten minutes. Uh, we'll let everyone else hang out out here. Uh, Andres, uh, I'll take the judges into a breakout room, and I'll let you uh, uh, keep keep everyone else entertained out here. Uh, so <laughs> judges, if... Uh, judges, if you could come into the breakout room that I just created, uh, and only judges, uh, we will be able to deliberate and make a decision here. Uh, and then we will also have the People's Choice Award that Andres will be conducting out here. Okay, judges, I'll see you in the breakout room. All right, let's do it, y'all. So, so as we mentioned, one of the awards that we'll be uh, giving out is the People's Choice Award. And so what I wanted to do is just open up a poll um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll be the only one that can see the answers and we'll go ahead and announce that with the judges decisions as well. And so Ian uh, made the poll for me. So sh this should be easy. Let's see if, uh, if it works. Okay. So I'm going to launch this poll right now. Um, take some time, deliberate, reflect on what you saw, some of the things that went well, some of the things that didn't, and let's hear it for the people's choice. All right. So let me open this poll. And I hope, <laughs> I hope you don't see the responses in real time. I want this to be a surprise. All right, let's get it. Are y'all able to see like the live response thing or no? Wait, no, you can't see the responses in real time? Okay, good. Can you vote for ourselves? Somebody asked. Yeah, if you really, if you in earnest believe that yours was deserving over what some of the other presentations we saw, um, suppose you can, suppose you can, but let's, uh, Let's just think in terms of like the global community. What do we see? Uh, can I get some feedback here? Is the poll working or are y'all just like really being intentional about your deliberation? I'm not seeing any like responses coming through. Yeah, I, I, I voted. Oh, it voted. Okay. I voted too. Yeah, me as well. We Weird, yo. Okay, hold Excuse on. Me. Let me, let me just double check. Maybe I don't see the responses until I close the poll. Uh, I don't know. I'm not seeing anything. I thought I was supposed to update real time. That's all right. Let me, um, I don't want to spoil it. Let, let me just like, we'll, we'll keep it open, keep voting. Um, maybe when I close it, it'll show the results. Otherwise we can just do another quick round of voting. So let me just remember who you voted for. <laughs> we'll just figure it out as we go. All right. Hey, Andres, I was wondering, so it's only people on Zoom who are going to vote for the people's choice. 
Yeah, yeah. There's no way for folks to vote from uh, from YouTube or live whatever. Stream. Yeah, so it's gonna be us. So truly, like the TKS community, people's choice. Uh, not to say that those who are tuning in on YouTube are part of the community, but you know, like those who are here, right? Got it. Let me see. I'm gonna end this poll. Did most people vote? Yeah, I'm guessing most people got there. Okay, yeah, it's pretty quick. End poll. Oh wait. I'm not sure if it's working. Let me see if I download the results. What happens? Give me a CSV file. Let's see. Okay, weird. So it's like it's registering your votes, but it's not uh it's not actually giving me the analytics so let me just see all right let me just figure this out Uh, Andre, what song is playing in the background? This is uh, Superstar by Lupe Fiasco off of, uh, I forget the album. Let me see. I think The Cool. Yeah, it's off The Cool. Apparently, Lupe Fiasco is a professor at MIT now teaching about like rap theory and stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, a friend of mine went to go see him give a lecture like a few weeks ago, and I was like, wait, <laughs> Lupe Fiasco is at MIT? Um, yeah, yeah. If anyone has song recommendations, I'm happy to play them. I just got my Spotify and just queuing up whatever I've been like listening to recently. I like went down this rabbit hole of like rap from, I don't know, like the early 2000s and stuff. And so I've been listening to like Jay-Z, Lupe Fiasco um, and, and some of these other artists too. As I sit back, relax, see what comes, sip a vex. Think about the sexy singers that I want to sex. I probably go to jail for Patty LaBelle. Ooh, Regina Bell, she probably do me swell. Jasmine Guy was fly, Mariah Carey, it's kind of scary. All right, I'm going to BRB. Hopefully, Stephen and the judges don't go. I got to pee so bad. <laughs> Hold on, I'll be right back.
paid them all the day. Hey, my DJ Janae, he like it when they say everybody moving by D. Got Whitney Houston boosting from Bobby. As I bust the cherry, your mama couldn't carry. Back shots to Shaka, I know that's scary. Sade, ooh, I know that's tight. Smack Tina Turner, give a flashback to I. Andres, I was wondering, how did how did you become a director at DKS? Oh man, uh, really long story. Uh, since we got time, so what happened was I was working at a nanotech startup that was trying to commercialize like copper indium disulfide quantum dots for like agriculture, space, solar, etc. And uh, I got an email from like Dan Jacob, who's like our partnerships lead at TKS. And he's like, hey, we got kids who are working on nanotech. Do you want to be a mentor for them and just like consult on their projects and give them feedback and whatnot? And so at first I thought it was a scam. I was like, who's Dan Jacob? Like, first of all, that name sounds made up. Second of all, I was like, never heard of TKS. And so after some Googling and actually learning about what the org did, I was like, whoa, this is legit. So I was, I was impressed. And so I signed up on the mentorship platform that uh, y'all might know and that we'll have access to in TKS. And, you know, kids would reach out and they'd be like, hey, you know, you have 30 minutes here and there to talk about a solar cell I'm designing or fabrication methods for electronic materials, whatever. Uh, some talked about polymers because I was doing a lot of polymer science at the time. And um, so that was kind of like a real casual thing I was doing on the side. And then eventually it came to like kind of a a stopping point with the work at, at that nanotech startup. And I was like looking for new opportunities and wanted to join other teams that were growing and doing cool work. Um, and I thought maybe it'd be fun to pivot into education. So I actually interviewed like a while back, I forget when it was like 2021 or something. Like I interviewed for a director position and I didn't get it, but failed there. Like, but it was like, it was bittersweet because you know, everybody on the TKS team, the V, the team, all, everybody was just like, we really like you, we want you to join. I think you'd be a great fit. We just don't got the students for it, right? The enrollment numbers weren't what we thought they were. We're gonna shuffle directors internally and kind of keep scaling in future years. So I was like, all right, well, keep in touch, right? And so then I like moved to Boston, got involved with MIT, taught a class in engineering design. Um, and then I got a like, full-time gig doing battery work, uh, essentially characterizing materials for this company called Form Energy that's building like renewable energy storage systems. And um, after like six months of that, I was just like so miserable with the engineering work, just like being in lab all day and just like heads down grinding on like, you know, scanning electron microscopy or x-ray diffractometry, et cetera. And I, I realized at that time, I was like, oh, education is what really, I'm really curious about. And so it was, uh, it was good. Cause then I retouched base with Naveed and he was just like, you want to come work for us? <laughs> I was like, yeah, get me out of here. Get me out of this engineering job. Um, anyway, you can ask me more later, but it looks like the judges are back. So I'll stop my share. And nice. let's do it. How'd it go, Stephen, the judges? It went great. Do you have an answer for the poll of the People's Choice Award? We'll, we'll do this one last. I, sure. I, I do have an answer. I just, I have been not sharing because uh, the analytics, like they're not uploading live. Um, and, oh. But then I downloaded the CSV of the results and all the votes were there. And so here, I'm going to share results. Do you want to do, do that first, Stephen? Uh, yeah, I think doing people's choice first is uh, usually kind of juicy. So let's okay. see what people's choice result is. Yeah. If it doesn't work, we might just reopen the poll and try it again. Okay, so okay. here's the results sharing uh, people's choice. Drum roll, please. Okay. Wow. Where are we at? Do you see them? Yeah. Medichat wins by just one, no, two votes. There we go. All right. <laughs> Medichat. Congrats. Congrats. Woo. Excellent. Thank you all for voting. Glad it worked. Okay, and then uh, the judges, we had a good little deliberation there. Uh, Kareen is actually going to uh, give us the results working backwards um, from best presentation to then most impactful to then best overall. Kareen? Sounds good. Well, first off, thank you all so much for your presentations today. It was super interesting to hear from you all, and I think I learned a lot of new things, as did the other judges. 
Um, so I'll start by sharing the TED award that we gave for the best presentation. That goes to MediChat. So congratulations, second award today. <laughs> Um, moving on our impact award for the idea that could make the biggest impact. We've given, given that to pitch. So congratulations. And finally, the best overall award that speaks for itself, PYE. So thank you all. It was really tough to decide between them and we've got some great notes on all of your projects and really appreciate learning more about them today. So thank you for your time. There we go, everybody. Okay. A lot of hard work over the last 48 hours and the week before that ideating, putting things together. Um, you know, the real result here is what you've learned, not just in your own research and in your own work, but from each other. Uh, and I hope some of the projects that you've worked on here are things that you will want to continue to work on. You know, we've seen a lot of projects from TKS spin out and continue, uh, whether it's in exactly the form that it started or whether it got modified based on advice and feedback and guidance. Uh, that I think is some of the most exciting work that comes out of what you guys do here at TKS. So anyway, thanks again to our judges for their time and their feedback. We really appreciate that. Obviously, thank you to the teams for your hard work uh, and everything you put into this. Uh, and I can't wait to hear from you guys next week as you continue to explore whether these ideas are things that you want to build out for real in one way or another. Andres, any final words? Ditto to everything you just said, Stephen. I think maybe what I want to hear is actually the voices of these students. Um, if you want, just unmute, show some love for our wonderful <laughs> judges, for all the feedback yeah. and deliberation they've given us. Let's hear it. Let's, let's unmute ourselves and, and say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. So much. thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Awesome. With that, we'll see you next time. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Great work. Yeah. Have a great day. Great work, guys. Bye.